What's up guys, this is Characters, and we are back on the series How to Master 6 Max Zoom. Episode number 14, I think, today, flatting from The Big Blind. The reason I'm bringing this episode into the game is that I think it's actually... Someone sent me a private message recently, um, asking about topics or videos where this is covered, and I was kind of like having a brainstorm. I think this is one of the areas that I've covered the least throughout my grinder school career as a video producer. And it's definitely one of the topics that's most relevant these days. It was covered a bit in areas like uh, Poker Recess, the series I made with my student Elliot. Check that out if you haven't seen it. It's a very good sort of template for learning how to reduce red line losses and defend appropriately from the blinds, particularly in spots like big blind versus button and big blind versus small blind, which are the two most common sort of steal situations you'll that you'll run into when you're the big blind. These are the positions that get opened the most. So... Um, yeah, basically like this episode today is going to be all about reasons for why we are going to consider calling in the big blind. This is very different from the small blind. In the big blind we are getting much better pot odds, we are closing the action, um, and so there's much more incentive to actually defend by flatting. In the small blind there are times when we don't even want to have a flatting range as you'll see me demonstrate throughout this series, throughout other videos and throughout live play. Um, in this series where I show you where I don't have a flatting range from the small blind. We will, however, always, with normal stack sizes and normal situations, have a flatting range from the big blind against any position open, especially against like the button and the cutoff and the small blind that will widen up considerably. So today we're mainly going to look at flatting out of position. Um, and there are three reasons really to flat from the big blind. Reason one is... Reason 1, Reason 2 is Reason 2, and Reason 3 is Reason 3. Pretty informative, right? But this is just the layout of the PowerPoint today. We're going to go over them one by one. Then I'm going to talk about post-flop balance because it's all very well to understand what hands to flat pre-flop, but if we don't know how to play those after the flop, that's a bit of a problem. And I want to talk a bit in that section about how people get stuck in a vacuum too much and they freak out about post-flop, not understanding that they can just play their range and, you know, play in a pretty decent, solid way and just reduce the amount they lose from the blinds in this manner. So here's the secret to blind play. It doesn't have to be that uncomfortable and horrible. There are ways that we can reduce what we lose in the blinds so that we can make more money overall, um, so that the winnings that we make from other positions are going to you know, be way more above our break-even line because we've reduced our losing situation significantly, like the blinds. So three reasons to flatten the big blinds. Um, let's get into it. So back in the day, players used to avoid flatting opens out position like it was the plague. They adopted a horrible 3-bet or fold game and folded far too much to steals as a result of this. I remember back in the day, like it was just like, don't flat from the big blind, you will be dominated and you will be out of position and you will not have the initiative. Like, oh my god, the initiative, like this was such a huge thing. Um, so what, we weren't the person that raised the last street, does that really mean that, okay, yeah, we have a cap range, it's not the best, but it doesn't actually mean that there's some reason that we can't defend on the flop. People used to think that you had to play like super fair or fold when you didn't have the initiative. And the C-bets used to... That's why people used to run like 90% CBET numbers and it actually worked because no one defended enough on the flop. These days, not so much the case. People have realized that, wait a minute, I actually have a chunk of hands in my range that are decent that I can call with pre and I can call with many of them on the flop as well. And if I have all those good value hands I'm calling on the flop, wait, I can actually like float a bit wider as well out of position and stop my opponent from being able to just like barrel me relentlessly with the initiative, which is really not as big a thing as it was once thought to be. Heroes should pretty much always have a flatting range big blind versus button, for example, and indeed against other spots as well, and can call opens for three main reasons. So we'll use this as a model. Like most of my examples today are going to talk about big blind versus button, just it's such a commonly misplayed situation where people don't defend enough in. Um, just to give you an idea, one stat you should be using there is fold big blind to button open, or big blind versus... I think that's what it's called. Yeah, fold. No, there's one called fold to B U or B T N open. Sorry, fold to B T N open on Poker Tracker Four, um, and you can filter that for spots where you are in the big blind. You can make it big blind specific. Generally, in the big blind, you should only be folding um, around sort of low to mid sixties, no higher than that. But you will see this is in games where people do a lot of smaller raising, like two point five x and min raising and things like that. Obviously in games where people have three point five xing like it's two thousand and one, um you want to be a bit tighter because their risk to reward on their steel is much worse and you just don't have the obligation to defend anywhere near as much. 
All right, that said, let's get into the three reasons. So the first one is that hero is in good shape versus villain's opening range on plenty of flops. We're gonna to come to see what this means, but basically here, we're not talking about flopping a set once in a blue moon, we're talking about, you know, taking a good hand to the flop that will actually flop good pairs relative to the range that villain is opening. Reason two, we can flat when hero is not frequently in good shape, but has sufficient implied odds. So we may we don't flat pocket fours big line against under the gun because we think that we're often going to be like have a powerhouse hand on the flop. We do it because the times we do flop the immensely strong full house or or set that we're going to be able to make enough money from villain's tight range, especially where villain is a weaker player or whatever. So implied odds can override frequently being in bad shape if we think that we get paid off enough when we make our big hand to compensate for our investment pre flop. That's what implied odds is all about. Hero is. Not frequently in good shape, has poor implied odds, but the redeeming feature is that he has pot odds that make calling better than folding. Pot odds don't make, need to make calling plus EV from the point of view of the whole hand. Pot odds, are, their job is not to do that. Their job is more just to tell you whether or not you can call the open. That's to say, is, is calling better than folding. Folding will lose you a big blind when you're in the big blind. Overall, you will have a big blind less in your stack. If by calling you only have 0.85 of a big blind less in your stack by the end of the hand, on average, then calling is better than folding and it's an improvement. And it may well be the best line. So let's get into the first reason. This is again, you know, a split video as is the format of this um, series between lecture, classroom format and live play practical application. So I do want to get in like good 20, 25 minutes of play after this. So let's go through quite quickly. So... Hero is frequently in good shape on the flop when he has a hand that often flops hands capable of beating villain's value betting range post-flop. So we're not looking for hands that are going to be ahead of villain's range because any hand when it, or frequently ahead of villain's range, because any hand when it flops a pair is often going to be ahead on average. It's going to have like plus 50% equity against a lot of ranges, apart from like really tight ones that contain an abundance of over pairs or if the board texture is really wet or whatever. But in general, you're going to have a hand that's ahead most of the time it connects anyway. So that's not really enough to call for reason one being in good shape. We want a hand that's actually ahead of villain's value betting rates because if that's the case, it means that we're the ones doing the domination, not him. We're the ones that have the, the better kickers, the better pairs that can extract the value. We don't want to be calling an open without the other two reasons being good for us, solely hoping to like beat bluffs post-flop when we connect in the best sort of commonly possible way. When we connect in that commonly possible way, we want to actually be extracting value from good hands in villain's range too. So let's take some examples. This hand, ace queen off, is going to be a call or a three bet against an open on a six max cash game in almost every situation. It's going to be a call where villain's range is um, tighter for opening and we're and he's not continuing to loads of three bets and so we're playing a more polarized game. And it's going to be a three bet in spots where we can just add it to our either linear or polar, um, you know, more abundant value range where we've got wider value range in a polar model um, for value where villain is continuing more to three bets and opening significantly wide. So ace queen is in good shape versus the cutoff opening range of a standard reg again for all these situations just assume that hero is in the big blind as that's our focus for today. So it will flop top pairs that dominated that dominate the reg's value betting hands post flop. So the reg is clearly going to be opening a bunch of like queen 10, queen 9, queen jack, king 9, king 6 suited or whatever, or a6 suited in the cutoff, all these kind of things, and Hero is going to dominate those on flops where he flops top pair. So clearly ace-queen is a fine call in the big blind against a cutoff open, if and only if it's not a better to three better for value, but we'll ignore that for now. So this is clearly good enough to call with. Um, for reason one, it's in good shape post-flop against villain's value range. Villain will value bet um, queen-jack on queen-6-3, and we crush that completely. So it's not just that it's ahead of Villain's air when Villain whiffs the flop or doesn't connect well, it's actually ahead when Villain does connect well as well sometimes, which is what we want in order to call for reason one. Reason one is not the only reason to call. There are often other reasons that we can call, like two and three, but right now we're just focusing on reason one and talking about what hands are called for this reason. Just because a hand is a call for one reason doesn't mean that it can't be called for another reason or a combination of two reasons or whatever. So these reasons aren't mutually exclusive, it's just that one will normally be the presiding, dominating reason for why we should call, and if we don't have one of the three reasons, then we can't call. Fours is not in good shape versus a button opening range of any player, because, okay, sure, if you stove its equity before the flop, it might be like 
40% or whatever, but it's not going to be in good shape in the sense that on most flops it flops really badly, it flops hand that can only have two outs to improve when behind, and when it's ahead it's very vulnerable, and hands have a lot of equity against it, it just flops very badly. So clearly against Villain's value range on the flop, if Villain is value betting a flop and we have not flopped a set with this hand, we can't call, um, we can't be happy continuing against Villain's value range. Therefore, we can call fours pre-flop for reason one being in good shape. It's not in good shape unless it flops a set and that doesn't happen often enough to be relevant for the purposes of reason one because reason one stipulates that hero needs to be frequently in good shape on the flop, not just one in nine times when he flops a set. King nine suited is a hand that obviously the cards are fused together into one here it looks like, but this is a hand that is um, going to be pretty bad to call in a lot of situations. For example, like under the gun opens and we have this hand in the big blind, we're not going to be calling. However, it's in good shape versus a button men stealing range, but not versus an under the gun opening range from the average rig. So when the button men steals, like his range is going to be pretty damn wide for that, like 40, 50, 60%, maybe wider. And so King 9 will actually start the flop top pairs that are in good shape against, you guessed it, Villain's value betting range pulls flop. So Villain could open King Rag, he could open 9x and we dominate those hands. He can open like crappy pairs that we dominate on nine high boards, things like that. So this hand is in good shape, it can be called for reason one against wider ranges, but not against tighter ranges. Position helps as well, by the way, for reason one. Position helps with all of these reasons, as you'd expect. Reason two is having sufficient implied odds. If we're assessing calling a hand for reason two, we're automatically assuming that we couldn't call it for reason one, because if we can call it for reason one, chronologically, it makes sense that we just call it for that reason. So here we're dealing with hands that don't frequently flop well and flop hands that are doing well against villains value betting range post flop, hands that don't fall into the criteria of calling for reason one. So here has sufficient implied odds when his hand can recoup enough money on average relative to his investment to see the flop. So if you're making back equal amounts or more than... Um, the amount you invest relative to how often you flop the hand. So with a pocket pair, you flop a set 12% of the time. So if you are making back sort of nine, 10 times what you invest, then you're kind of breaking even on your set mind due to how often you flop that hand. So different hands have different degrees of implied odds. The hands that flop a strong hand that's capable of stacking villain more often have more implied odds than hands that only do it very rarely. So pocket threes has much more implied odds than a six off. A6 often needs that miracle 6-6-3 six, six, flop or whatever to be doing really well, whereas, you know, your pocket threes just need any board with a three on it. It's much easier to do that. So sixes, let's take this hand first. We'll need to make roughly 10 times its investment back from the pot plus villain stack in order to break even on an implied odds-based big blind defend. Now I say that implied odds-based big blind defend because obviously you could be calling sixes in some rare spots for reason one or for reason three, which we'll get to. Um you could have a really, really wide range and have position on the player and think that sixes will actually have some frequent strength and can be called for reason one sometimes. Um, it's not going to be common, but basically normally when we're assessing whether to call sixes, it's going to very often be for reasons two or three, primarily reason two, implied odds in most situations. So we'll very easily be able to call um, an under the gun 3x open with full 100 BB stacks, assume that's the case unless stated otherwise, when that open comes from a bad player but we won't be able to do it versus a button open from a 55% reg range because the 55% button range is very wide, you know, it's opening 3x, giving us a worse price. It's sketchy to call sixes there. I don't think it's terrible or anything, but it's not good. It's certainly terrible to call like deuces there. Um, big blind versus button to a 3x from a wide range. You don't have the implied odds. Villain's range is tight, so when he misses the flop, um, or when he hits the flop, rather. Sorry, Villain's range is loose. When he opens the button so he's going to miss the flop a lot so even when we hit the flop with our six we're not getting paid off all that often whereas when he's a fish under the gun he's going to a have a tighter range and b just be flailing around and stacking off with one pair and making all kinds of mistakes which is very good for boosting our implied odds with our sixes nine eight suited is a hand that has worse implied odds than sixes so we'll need to make more than 10x its investment to call for this reason because it, you don't flop two pair plus or straight or flush draw that's really good with 9-8 suited as often as you flop a set. We might flop like a bad flush draw or straight draw, like fairly frequently with this hand, but you're gonna flop a set more often than you're gonna flop the hands you really want with 9-8 suited. So sixes just makes a better implied odds call than 9-8 suited. 
again, sticking with reason too. There are situations in which 9-8 suited is a much better preflop call than 6s, but it's not for reason 2, not for implied odds alone. It has a lot more frequent strength, sometimes you can call it 9-8 suited for a combination of reasons 1, 2 and 3, so very much a, very much a hybrid hand, but you won't, it won't make a better reason 2 call per se than, than 6s will. So this hand, it will be callable versus the fist 2x under the gun open very happily, um, with its implied odds, with it, just the fact that it's quite flexible and the price is very good. Um, its implied odds are great there, but big blind versus um, but versus a larger open from a more competent player, this kind of doesn't make any sense. Take away under the gun there, 2x open, big blind versus cut off, say. I don't know why the under the gun is in there. Um, but against a larger open from a more competent player, this hand will struggle because its implied odds are worse. Implied odds, remember, is a ratio. It's not just about um, the amount of money that you can make. It's also about the amount of money that you're risking in order to try to make that money. Right now the dog is like actually looking at me and like looks really kind of confused by what I'm saying and is like moving her head back and forward as if she's really trying to absorb this information. She's now just given up and laid down on the couch so fail from the dog to understand implied odds. What do you expect? I mean it's not easy. So anyway with um, whether or not suited here we can often call for a variety of reasons basically and sometimes for a reason too but it's not as much of a pure reason to call as pocket sixes is. The next hand we'll consider is 5-4 off which is trashy. Obviously it flops top pair hardly ever. Calling this hand ever for reason one is just never going to be a prospect, it's just a ridiculous thought but it can be a call for reason two. It'll rarely be callable from played odds, out of position especially but only for a very good price and against a very bad player. If a 12-4 fish, who's a horrible player, he's like a net fish that just has like the nuts and probably is, plays really badly as well, opens from the button for men, Hero can call 5-4 off because this guy is probably going to like just give up when he misses the flop for a start, which is kind of a different reason that's going into the, the realms of pot odds and outplaying your opponent for those pot odds. Um, but also, he is going to have like over pairs a lot, so when Hero does flop like the 6 three deuce flop or the four four eight flop or the king four five flop he's you know going to make a lot of money so as long as stacks are sufficiently deep there are factors that can make even trashy terrible hands like five four defends in a big blind for implied odds reasons okay so that was pretty quick take a minute to pause this uh, video and read over those slides if you want i'm going to move on now to the next slide so please do that now if you want to just like digest that a bit more fully reason three Pot odds make calling best. Now it's not to say that they make it amazing, they just make it better than folding. So Hero can call for this reason when his hand flops poorly versus villain's range. Implied odds are lacking, so again we are talking about situations where we are not happy calling for either reasons 1 or 2. But the EV of calling is greater than minus 1 BB, which is the overall EV for the hand. Be careful here, it's not the EV from point of decision because the EV of folding from point of decision is always zero, but the EV for the overall hand of folding your big blind is minus one. And so, the EV of calling for the whole hand just needs to be greater than minus one. From point of decision, we'd say it needs to be plus EV. So the difference there is, for the whole hand, I'm talking about money that's already been committed involuntarily by Hero being in the big blind. When I say point of decision, I mean what Hero does facing the raise. So, if we say folding is neutral from point of decision, then it's plus EV to defend. It loses less money overall for the hand thing than folding does. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, King Deuce suited is, I think, kind of a nice looking hand, especially when it's spades. This hand flops dominated pairs and non-nut draws, but it has enough playability to call about the men open from a wide range. So it's, you know, it's not hopeless, and when other factors like pot odds are very, very good, it's going to usually be a call. However, against the 3x open from the button, um, it's probably either a 3-bet or a fold because the less money you have to call relative to the size of the pot, the less well you have to do to break even or better on that call. So even if you end up like folding lots of flops with King Deuce suited and not doing very much in general that's useful with this hand, that can still be okay, and it can still make calling good. Sorry, I need to like yawn, and I'm kind of trying to suppress it, which is why my voice is going weird. I think it's gone away. Um, and so, King Deuce suited is a hand. It doesn't. It doesn't 
perform amazingly out of position. It's not going to like you know set the world on fire, but it is going to do well enough for the price of a min open against a wide range. Like you flop a pair of kings against a wide range, you're gonna have like eighty percent equity or something. You're gonna be like doing very well. Um, and if you flop a draw, that's also very good. And if you don't, you know, you can still fold to a CBET a lot there and do better than folding would have done pre-flop. I'm not saying that you should play super fair or fold on the flop. That's not a good strategy. But even if you did, king do suited could still be a call. And that shows that when you play a better strategy, it becomes a very plus EV call to the mid-open. But probably not to the 3x unless your skill edge is good. Villain's too fair or fold. Villain makes a lot of mistakes. You have some implied odds with this hand as well. It's just not primarily a call for reason two. It's a reason three call, primarily. That's why we're calling it for that reason. Twos, again, can be an implied odds call, but there are times when it's actually a call for reason three instead for pot odds. Let's say the button opens for, for a min open. We can call with this hand for reason three. It's not for implied odds really, because though there are some and it's a quote unquote implied odds type hand, the button opening range, which we're against, is going to be too weak and wide for us to realize that much implied odds, especially with bad position. So the fact we call deuces doesn't rest against the min open from the button that is, it doesn't rest on the fact that we have implied odds, though we have some, it's because pot odds are again going to combine with those implied odds, but mainly it's the pot odds that are going to make calling better than folding when we have twos against the min open, but don't call twos to the 3x, you need to do so much better there. Your pot odds are not 3 to 1, they're 2 to 1, they're much worse. In fact, they're, they're worse than 2 to 1, sorry, they're, they're not good at all. Ace 9. This hand is not in great shape on many flops versus a button 2.5x, but the EV of a flat should be comfortably better than minus one big blind. So when the button opens to 2.5x and we have this hand in the big blind, again, we're not expecting to do amazingly here. We're just expecting to do better than folding. Okay, so post-flop, it can be uncomfortable to play readless out position. This is true, but that's until Hero gets a better grasp of the game in the following two ways. He learns how to play his range in a balanced way, a balanced way, and he accepts a bit of variance. When you're playing your range balance, you're doing it because you lack information to do something better, i.e. find the right exploitative strategy. You don't want to adopt an exploitative strategy at random for no gain. You want to remain more in the realms of GTO poker. So, sorry, I just dropped a battery on the floor. That's what that noise was because I'm fidgeting as usual. At least batteries don't make like loads of noise when I'm playing with them unless I drop them on the floor. Um, so we need to accept variance when we're playing readless because we're playing this balanced way for good reasons. We don't know what's better. So there will be more variance when we're playing like 50 NL zoom, like I said way back at the start of this series, than there will be playing 50 NL regular when you're table selecting. When you're playing 50 NL regular, you're frequently going to be building up a better archive of reads on your opponents. You're going to be encountering more fish, players against whom you will want to play exploitative. And so you'll be playing exploitative lines much more often. In the zoom pool, you'll be playing balance much more often due to being readless, and therefore you'll you'll have higher variance because you won't be narrowing opponents' ranges and, and adopting correct strategies as frequently. You'll just be adopting the best strategy you can. GTO poker is a make-do strategy with the assumption that the opponent is not doing anything outrageous because we don't know what that is if he is. So... Once we learn that being out of position doesn't need to be a huge problem, of course it makes everything less e less high EV, but it doesn't mean that we need to freak out and go into some stupid mode where we just fold everything. When we realise that we can play our range in a pyramidal fashion, where the hands that we call with shrink from street to street, we start off pre-flop with 100% range before anything's happened. Our range when we get dealt two cards is 100% of hands, because we get dealt every hand out there that's possible to get dealt. Then someone raises pre-flop and we call a range to that in the big blind. And that range is actually a lot lower, a lot less than this 100% of hands. This pyramid is not literal, it's just a representation in the abstract of what's going on here. Um, obviously, it shrinks much more than that seems to show. We don't call with like 85% of hands. So the pyramid's much more of a steep kind of um, decline towards the top, I suppose, in reality. But that would have taken much more effort to create. That sounds so lazy, but yeah, I wouldn't have looked as nice either. This looks nice and neat. Anyway, so then we get to the flop with our pre-flop calling range and we call a percentage of that in the flop and our range shrinks again towards the turn and again towards the river and then again at showdown. So the idea here is that Hero basically should make sure that his calling range is facing multi-street aggression 
So when villains betting each street at you, you know, the dreaded spot that you're inclined to try and avoid at the start of your poker career because it's uncomfortable. You don't know how to balance your range. You don't know how to play like this. Fine. Play like a net when you're first learning the ropes. But when you've been playing for like a year, you've got no excuse for not doing this. Like you should be well on your way to understanding balance and range construction by then if you're studying properly. If you're watching old crappy materials that just focus in a vacuum the whole time, you'll never learn this stuff. But if you're willing to accept modern poker theory, then you will learn this stuff. So hero should make sure that his range does shrink, but not overly massively, like not hugely. So how much is too much? Well, first thing to state is that it may not always be po possible to defend enough of your range that would be kind of optimal on a GTO basis. But there are some flops and runouts that are just very good for villain's range and bad for ours, where a villain just has superb range advantage, like king 6-6 six, six, and position. What can we do against that, really? These are just inherent advantages. If we try to defend an optimal quote-unquote amount of his c-bets, we'll probably just get crushed, honestly. So we should actually look to overfold there, just naturally. Um, but there will be ranges that we can defend more on as well, than is balanced and get away with that. Um, that are very, very good for our range in certain spots, where our range is quite well defined and tight and just hits very well and concentrated on a flop. For example, we call big blind against under the gun, the thought comes like 9, 8, 7, 2, 2, and that just smashes us really well. We have 9s, 8s, 7s, jack 10 suited as a much higher concentration of our range than villain has those hands. Anyway, so just bear in mind, like take this with a pinch of salt, like different streets cause for, or give cause for different defense frequencies as being the optimal base strategy. Um, but calling 40 to 60% of your range on each street is going to be a good place to start. On the flop, you can have that as a bit lower, like closer to, you can be like down at, well, I guess you should be down at sort of like fold to see bits that should normally be around 45 to 50. So that's kind of the vicinity that you're looking at. Then on the turn, um, that counts multi-way pots as well, though heads up, you should fold a bit less. On the turn, you should be looking to fold somewhere like just under half of your range, like 40% of your range again. The 60 is there just so that you can fold more of your range in spots where it's very good for your opponent, obviously, naturally. But generally speaking, if you can defend 60%, sorry, I'm saying I'm confusing this because I'm talking about folding 40% and I'm talking about calling. You generally want to call around 60% of your range on each street, fold around 40. This is like the kind of rough um, Ed Miller-esque kind of way to present the situation, but there will be factors that change that is all I'm saying. So for now, if you can aim somewhere within that margin, a bit to more, more towards the calling 60% on each street than 40, you will emulate balance at least approximately and you won't be like hor horrendously unbalanced. So that's what to work out. Where am I in my range? I've called the flop. I've got a bottom pair. Villain's better the turn. Am I in the top 60% of my range? No, therefore I can fold and play balance and not have to worry about it. If Villain bluffed me that time, it's not important. It doesn't matter. I'm playing my range in a way that he can't exploit it. And people don't exploit your hand because they don't know what that is. They exploit your range because they can work out what that is. So, you know, play in a balanced way. Just taking a sip of water after that rant. We're going to put this into practice now. We're going to play some live play with particular focus on spots where we have flatted, um, hopefully, excuse the mess on the desktop, where we flatted against the an open out of position normally and we're looking to play our range post flop in this pyramidal fashion. So let's get into the session as usual. Let's get the recorder up on screen. Typical Friday morning for me. I've got like a nice schedule of work now on Friday mornings. I teach a guy um, that wants early morning lessons about 8 o'clock and I get up nice and early and I teach another guy at 10. I do make a presentation, do the video. It's kind of like, I like a bit of routine in my work. It helps me actually be a bit more productive. Jack 6 is not callable for any of the three reasons here. It does not have, it's not in good shape. It's implied odds are not sufficient for this price and pot odds will probably not make calling better than folding against a cutoff range. So we can just fold there. But always thinking about at least subconsciously, you know, when we're really used to stuff like how it does against against um, villain's range and whether it's callable for any of those factors that we just discussed. I flatted here, um, honestly, because I think that I can just have a flattening range in this situation because there's a fish in the big blind and I don't need to be too worried about getting squeezed ever. It's just not gonna happen much for the fish. So 10-9 becomes a call. And I could lead that flop, but like my hand just doesn't have any overcards. If I had like king queen, I would just lead there and just play a leading range against the fish, to be honest, because I think I would, I would lead some jack x there as well. Um, I don't know, I mean, I do need to keep some, some of the burden of defense does rest on me here, so I do need to check all some good hands on this flop as well. 
and check do other stuff than fold here but 10 9 of hearts is just not going to be part of a defense range it's going to be the hand that i called pre-flop and then elected the fold on the flop and actually when i'm three-way that folding flop portion is going to be wider i'm not going to take as many hands to the turn when i'm three-way because villain is helping me defend um the other villain the c betters required fold equity it's split between me and the other villain in the hand. Therefore, I don't bear the whole, you know, the sole brunt of the responsibility um, to defend there. This is loose-ish. It equates to me three bit over bluffing a little bit here, but people overfold that spot as a population. That's why I do it. Not massively over bluffing. So I don't want to make my HUD print just really obviously bluff heavy or anything like that, but I will over bluff a little bit there. Are ten nines on the cusp, I'll, I'll open it against a reg and fold to a three bit. Again, that's fine. You know, this applies preflop as well. Sure, I open 10 9, it's at the bottom of my opening range. I have no problem folding it. I'm just playing a balanced strategy. So, yeah, when I'm multi way, um, my preflop calling range and my flop call calling range are going to have a bigger gap between them. That's to say, I'm going to be folding a lot more of my preflop calling range on the flop when we're three way because A, C betting ranges are stronger in a vacuum, and B, out with a vacuum, my responsibility to defend is not borne solely by me. My other villain in the pot shares that responsibility and therefore the need for me to defend lots of my range to a C bet is diminished, strategically speaking. Queen 10 is a bit weak for me to like isolate this fish with many 3x's so we'll just go ahead and fold even though we have position. Queen 10 suited, I would either call a throw in a 3 bet there for isolation purposes against the fish. It's not like strictly value but it kind of equates to value the way the hand plays out a lot. Um, 5-4, I'll go ahead and just about open this, it's on the cusp again. This guy looks quite tight, but he has three bet 14%. That's quite a lot, actually. Maybe I should fold that pre, actually. Um, yeah, and he just goes ahead and three bet. He may three bet too much in this spot. Let me see, big blind, 15%. Yeah, it doesn't matter. I'm not gonna do anything with five four suited to the bottom, but I will mean that I'll probably over bluff a little bit with my four bets there, based on the info I have. And yeah, just look to, to fold a little bit less, call a few more hands as well. King Queen, I can flat against it. I'm going to open because it's suited. I three bit bluff King Queen off. Eight, so I'm just going to continue to check after checking flop, and that river sucks really badly. So we can probably fold on that river. Honestly, he can have some air here, but probably not enough. Villain goes ahead and checks that flop. Um, I'm going to check this flop back a lot actually. Like I'm not going to stab this texture very much. I'm actually going to protect my checking range and check back King Queen as well. So I can call more of it to turn and river delayed C bet lines. Um, because I'm definitely calling down with this line now in the turn and river. Like I don't think people just give up that flop that much. So I definitely want to, for that reason, I'm trying to just protect my range a little bit. This run out's not ideal, but I mean it's clear that I can I can value bet. I just don't have much air in my range, so I'm going to bet small. Um, villain donks flop. He's a fish. I just call with top pair, mediocre kicker. It could be a raise if I know he's really loose with his donking. I turn a straight dry call, I river a straight, I'm gonna call. Um, he can't have a flush, obviously, or he's queen sometimes, but it's not, I can never fold. Obviously, I don't see the value in raising. He just goes berserk with air, which is nice. Just take a note on that. So yeah, it was, there's no reason to raise these streets. Like I was working with one of my students who's a tournament player earlier, and like the instinct he has to like raise streets for no reason like with like top pair hands and stuff is quite remarkable. I think it's like a tournament kind of um, ethos. And honestly, I think it's misapplied in tournament play a lot as well, but especially in cash, like to raise there on the flop. I think it's horrible until we know that villain is like super, super retarded and just like, you know, like don't calling air on the flop basically or something of that ilk because you lose so much value against his bluffs by shutting the bluffs down there. Like you don't want to shut down like complete air on that board ever. Your hand is bluff catcherish. It's not like a humongous value hand that wants to build an enormous pot. Um, this this situation here, I'm gonna just give up king nine. Like I'm three way. I'm out of position. Someone will have ace x a bunch. Someone will have a pocket pair. This guy is super tight, which makes his range much more ace x heavy than usual. Um, this could be anything. Honestly, this stab here, he should stab like close to everything here, probably exploitatively. Although I will check all his flops sometimes against that because I do see that there's a a reggae possible reg on the button so I will check call some hands here even bad aces for sure I don't need to see that there so um yeah but king nine is obviously a check fold you see I'm always thinking about how I'm playing my range I'm just like being balanced there's no reason not to be in so so many of these situations not so much there against the fish where I was playing exploitatively it just happened to be that calling was best um in a vacuum but a lot of the time in this pool you'll see me play um exploitatively this guy's silver star so um it's, I mean it's a three bet anyway 
to be a bit shoved with Queens anyway, to be honest. But especially against a Silver Star. Um, pot here, if we bet 10, it's like, what, 36 and 30, yeah. So we do this over three streets. And we bet six on a flop. Um, kind of exploitative thing. Just that I think he's calling a lot of hands now, but not on certain runouts. So I just want to go ahead and get a lot of money in here in the earlier streets and leave myself a nice small river shove that I can just get in pot committed by then. Don't want him to like call twice and fold river with some pair. That turn bet may have been slightly too big actually. Not because villain folded, that's terrible reasoning, but just because it maybe isn't necessary to leave under half pot. I can just leave like half pot slightly over on the river and entice him to call more of his range on the turn. I just flat a jack eight off here without subconsciously to the main open without even realizing, which I think is fine. Um, I could do a few things on this turn. I might go for a check raise actually with this part of my range just for value. I think that would be fine. I could lead as well. It'd be okay. I don't expect 10 9 to ever be in here. And I think he will delete see by that turn sometimes, not loads. And uh, now I'm just gonna I check raise against Queen X. Can you have some two pair here? It's possible. I do sub. I'm gonna go for another check raise. I think I still have the best hand with two pair here, loads, and I want to give him the opportunity to bluff or uh, value bet that river. So I think it's not too thin to check raise there for value. If you get three bet, I'll probably have to. I don't know. It's weird if I get three bet honestly. It's just kind of bizarre. I don't expect it to happen much. I think the population wouldn't do it as a bluff. So I'd probably fold, just exploitatively speaking. And calling nines here, having... Like, this game is just so easy, like, when I play this game these days and I've devised all these strategies already. Like, you just feel, like, really comfortable. And that's what... I'm looking forward to getting back to the grind, honestly, because I can play such high volume these days comfortably um, and well and balanced that I feel like it's going to have a huge edge. To be honest, my game's stronger than it's ever been before. My coaching's better than it's ever been before. Just all the stuff, you know, like writing, teaching, just makes me feel a lot more com comfortable and confident. So that's why I always say to my students, like, work with your peers and do a bunch of work off the table. Eventually, you will build up this sort of um, repertoire of just, like, knowing what to do in loads of different situations. I'm going to make my C-bit size a fairly big here because it's not a board. Um, it's a board that I see a bit a lot more polarised on. It's going to fold nines there against the tight player's turn barrel. It's just not great. I'm just range betting this flop. Betting everything here against a fish for value, protection, bluff, you name it. Kangaroo 255 raises me on the flop. Power min raise playing a bunch of some full ring and some... Is that full ring? I think that's full ring. Zoom tables cannot be observed, obviously. I thought I would just double click on it, it would magically tell me what it was, but it doesn't work that way. Um, anyway, too far up on our range to fold here, but I'm not thrilled, to be honest. We'll see what he wants to do on the turn in river, um, but I don't want to fold at that point. I might fold this turn to a big bet here, actually, I think I will, because um, I don't really know enough yet. He'll slow down here with better kings because of the flush draw and make the awful play of check calling better kings here. So for that reason, I'm just going to check back, hit the showdown, realize my full equity, never get raised. No reason to bet that turn at all. River's going to be kind of close-ish. I don't really know. I do have a blocker to some flushes. Oh. What the hell are you doing, man? Like, do you raise flush draw on the flop, check turn when you make your flush, then pot river? Some fish certainly do, yeah. There's just too much air in here. It's too polarized, I have to call. Yeah. It's just too nonsensical, like sure you can play a value hand that way, I don't doubt it that people do, but there has to be enough air in there for me to have 33% equity, there just has to be, especially when I've got a spade, that helps. I'm going to check call this flop again, like don't raise this flop ever, and check all turn and value bet river. I have a bunch of air here, so nice and big makes a lot of sense with my range. My air wants to bet big here as well, so... Um, okay, going to 2.5x that, that spot line versus line. What the absolute hell is this? I don't understand. I'm so confused right now. This just looks way too weird to ever be a bluff against my polar range that's totally uncapped and contains boats. Um, that's not the same guy I just played the hand against before, is it? No, because his stats would be looser than that. I'm going to fold. I don't know, it's just really, really bizarre. I think it's just too weird um, to commonly be a bluff, to be honest. Just check calling that flop. I want to check fold the bunch there out of position. I don't have license to just go berserk and bet everything. 100, 100, um, this guy. What are you playing? One table, so you're a fish, therefore I'll just fold for now out of position. I'm not gonna four-bet bluff you because you'll never fold. Um, okay, this 3x with the chrome star and the small blind. 
and this board is a bit too coordinated to, to see bet with just two brute force raw over cards um, three way but heads up would be like pretty close to a range bet yeah I mean that, that line where we get raised there on the river I mean it's so weird it's just so weird that I don't like I can't see many value hands but at the same time like it's ridiculous and I mean I'm like clearly polarized like why do you ever want to do that just to fold out bluff surely you have ace high a lot there you're under the gun you know like why do you want to raise huge as a bluff there I just don't understand it seems even weirder like it's weird to raise for value like that but it's even weirder to raise as a bluff I think so yeah I mean I, I elected to fold which I think is fine um, I just expect this to be some fish who's just slow playing something like a boat on the turn or randomly tripped into like sixes occasionally or quads or it's so bizarre I don't know I don't hate Calder either honestly I'm just so confused by it he just seems so in line so far like he's not done anything yet if he had stats like sort of 50 60 50 over that sample I'd call but he's so inactive and it's so weird that I just think it's value more often than not and it's so big as well the sizing like it's needlessly big for a bluff against a polar range even if he didn't have showdown value Again, I'm ascribing some understanding of poker to my opponent, which is often a mistake. Um, but yeah, I need to be good quite often there to call with that price as well. So I think the fold's all right. Um, clear squeeze for value here. A squeeze fold. I'm happy if a fish calls me. Happy to win the pot. Not so happy to get four bet, but that's okay. It should be crushed when four bet by these players. So that's all right. And flatting nines here. Just for set mining purposes against the fish. I don't want to squeeze the ice lakes. He's not really opening wide enough for that. And going to check fold the flop because my hand is just very bad at improving it as best sometimes right here, but not really enough for me to do much about it. I don't think, especially when the other guy calls, and my hand gets a lot worse towards showdown. Um, do I have a raising range here? I have nines, I have sevens, probably, maybe, yeah, just about have sevens. That's all I have for value. If I gut shot, do I need to continue a gut shot here? Like the rest of my range is doing okay. No, I don't think I need to continue a naked gut shot. I think it's low enough down in this pyramid. Like it's one of the worst hands I flop. Despite having four outs, like it doesn't have any backdoor draws, flush draws. It's not going to be in the top 60% of my hands on that flop, I don't think. So I'm happy just folding. And I don't think I want a raising range. I just don't have that much value. Only got like the six combos of sets there. Here's some trips for us against the fitter fold looking fish. I devised that tag a while back, the fitter fold fish lilac tag. It's quite a good one. Um, I'm just going to bet two. Like it's slightly bigger than I would bet normally, but I mean, I have a value hand and he's not going to know what that means. It's just exploitatively probably better. Like he doesn't know that I don't bluff $2 there. I'm not going to play with this fish very much, so I'm just going to focus on vacuum EV. I'm not worried too much about it. So we'll do our usual um, 50 minute long video today. And then it's time to go and get some lunch because I'm starving. I'm going to one 2.5x here because Villain is very 3-bet or fold happy and I'm going to 4-bet if he 3-bets with Ace 4 suited. It just falls into that part of my range. Check calling the bottom left as standard. And check calling the bottom left again as standard. And check evaluating any river. And yeah, this is probably never a bluff ever. I'm just gonna fold. That sizing is just, I, I mean, I just never see a bluff. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I need like 20% equity there to call, but I just never see anyone ever bluff that sizing. I think it's like 10% or less you see a bluff there. So again, I'm just gonna over bluff my range here because I just think people fold too much when you open under the gun and get three better position. And I can give myself a pretty nice price as well, so. Get called, really, really bad flop, pretty decent for his range, no equity at all, just give me a give up and maybe at future streets. Going to check this turn as well because I don't have a two street value betting hand here um, and I can value bet rivers. If he bets here, like, folding's not out of the question, honestly. Now I'm just going to go ahead and I don't have that much air. Bet like four. Just a thin value bet. Trying to get called by, I don't know what, jacks. <laughs> Reaching a little bit here. Queen jack suited. There aren't many things that can call me. Might even be too thin to bet river, honestly. Definitely too thin to bet turn and river. That would just be absurd. I'm going to call here because there's multiple fish. And I'm, that's the guy that was weird before. I don't know what he is. He could be some kind of active reg, actually. Over, I mean, he's 1913, but he just took such a bizarre line. 
why do you check back turn and raise river? Like, surely no reg is horrible enough to do that as a bluff. Or, like, I don't know, I'm utterly confused by that line. I'm still perplexed by it. Maybe I should have... Oh, it's like, I'm so polarised and he just raises huge. Like, I'd understand, like, trying to, like... I'd semi-understand raising if he thought my range was, like, capped and linear and kind of, like, not that strong. But the fact that I can just have the nuts there and he's just raising enormous is just kind of ridiculous. So I just don't know. Don't know what to make of it, to be honest. I don't like folding a value hand given how many bluffs I have there. It's not balanced, but I'm just kind of making a guess about maybe it's too too uncertain, I guess, about what the best exploitative line is there. Maybe I should revert to balance and just call because I've got enough bluffs in my range that I probably should call that hand. Um, yeah, I'm going to range bet here against the reg. Like, this is it. They just won't be able to defend often enough there. There's nothing they can really do about it on Ace King 3. I say that like every video because that spot comes up so often, but it's important that you see bet enough there. You need to see bet the absolute hell out of those dry flops when you're batting against big blind and ranges are really wide because you men opened. Just got to see bet the absolute hell out of it. standard i'm not commenting on things guys that i think are just completely standard because you know you're on episode 15 of this video you've seen like 15 live plays you've got a good idea now how these games play and how i'm playing and why i'm doing what i'm doing so um yeah like do watch this video this series in order because it's ramping up complexity a little bit as it goes okay uh this dude is 25 13 so i'm just not going to get out of line with these three suited he just looks like I'm a non-reggish type player so Fold equity is probably limited with a 3-bet, and I can't flat it properly with those stacks at all with bad positions, so just going to be a fold. You see, I can open, especially when... It doesn't look like a fish, actually, but this guy does. So we've got, like, two potential fish in the blind, so clear open there. Um, King 5, also a clear cutoff steal, I think, with a tight-looking button. Let's not go all in. That wouldn't be a very good risk-reward ratio. And we do flop some back doors here, and I do think it's profitable to see bet half pot here, for sure. In a vacuum again, because I'm against the fish, that's my thinking. I only need 33% fold equity minus my, not my pot equity exactly, but minus some amount of fold equity for my pot equity, if that makes sense. I need to adjust that required fold equity target due to having pot equity as well. Um, King 5 here, this guy, what is he? I'm going to have a check in range here, so I'm going to check back on my really bad top pairs. Um, I'm just going to fold 6-7, it equates to a bit wide of a 3-bit range right off the bat without reads, that that's good. And then just betting turn, and betting river as well, because most king x will lead turn, to be honest. There's not too much king x, so it's going to check all twice. It's going to just lead if it's good, for the most part, not always. That's just kind of thin, this open, but this guy looks bad, so just go ahead and do it. There's no one 3-betting me either, I can see so far, so I can probably get away with opening king 10 off there. It's definitely a bit sketchy. It kind of depends on having a skill edge, I would say. Some opens are plus EV for anybody. Some opens are more plus EV for the coach than they are for the student, just because the coach is more experienced and makes higher EV of the post-flop situations that occur. Um, I'm going to just flat here with ace-jack right off the bat. I don't know anything about this guy. If he's stationing or whatever, I'll 3-bet for value. I'm just going to start betting like... Three streets here, like fairly. I oh, know I would bet that flop. Size is a mistake, so I bet that flop like pretty wide, and I think he checked folds a lot. So I just want to give myself a good price with my reins there and remain balanced rather than like make it huge. Um, now that I have bet huge, so I'm going to stay polarized and you know just polarize my range a bit. Um, this is probably too thin to bet river with here, honestly. When the backdoor drop completes, and you do see people check call over pairs here, and I do block the jack x. I do block aces as well, but that's not that likely to. I think I see queens, kings here. This is close, honestly. I don't mind a bit, but I think it's probably a check. Yeah, he does have queens, so. If those hands like queens are in his range, it's definitely too thin to um, to bet there. He probably saves me a street of value there, though, by taking the check call line. I would I'd rather bet queens there, because it's vulnerable. I'd rather check call like aces, to be honest, but people tend to do it the other way around. Because I don't have queens in my range, so queens and aces have the same showdown value. It's just that... Queens is more vulnerable, so it needs protection. It's going to raise here. This guy could be a reg. This limping strategy just doesn't work very well anyway when people do it, so I'm not really afraid of it. Checking back this flop to the ridiculous guy that never calls anything and doesn't understand the concept of today's video that you do need to call out the big line sometimes. 
anyone that plays 14, 13 is just terrible. Um, no offense if that's you, greater school listener. Um, again, just gonna take my polar three bet range here and go ahead and do that. And I'm gonna go ahead and see bet my range for really small in position here as well. Um, I'm gonna bet turn now for value and semi protection. Flop a draw here. Um, that's pretty good. There are some hands that can fall like nines, and I can maybe get like ace king king queen to fall by the river. So I'm gonna start running a multi way bluff here, so I can have some really good hands in my range, like sets and stuff, and maybe ace queen. If I choose to three bet that, I probably don't to be honest. I'll probably just flat it. But I know that I flat it actually because that's the way I play my range. So I just checked back turn. Did I? I meant to check back turn. I don't know what happened. I had like a brain freeze on the turn. Um, so I'm just not gonna bluff like too wide on this river. That's fine. What did I do in the turn there? That's really weird. I was like talking about the other hand, I just did it subconsciously. That's okay, like most of the plays I make subconsciously where I don't know I'm doing them are fine. So I'm gonna assume it was fine, but there might be the odd one like when I'm making a video that's not fine. So let's just check. Right, so we, yeah, we bet flop and we check back turn. Okay, that's fine. Um, I'm gonna call here. I got a fish behind. Fish play bad. Enough said. Double gutter time. Is it double gutter? Yeah, it's, it's an open end straight draw. That's what it was in the flop, so let's go ahead and just bet, try and win the pot and have equity win calls. Again in a vacuum. Whoa. Just sorry about that guys, just bringing up like a bunch of weird stuff. Um, Yeah, I've got the pots to just mine this. I do expect it to be very strong, just gonna play fair or fold. I'll lead the river if I get there basically. That's just weird. Okay. Min race turn with middle pair. Fine. All right, I'm gonna wrap up there because we've hit our 50 minute mark. So hopefully you enjoyed that live play. I thought there were a lot of cool situations there, actually a lot of illustrative things. Um, so the idea to take home from this video is thinking about where you are in your range and playing your range accordingly and playing balance. Yeah, this guy's min opening hijack. I don't know if he has a reg actually. Um, Ace jack. I wanna flat this, it's a great price, but it could be a fish. Yeah, I think I'm gonna squeeze. Cause this guy could well be a fish. I just don't know where this player is yet. I think he's a fish, he means not reloading. Um, I've seen it a few times now, yeah. I'm gonna go ahead and just see that reasonable here. Probably one and done because I think if I get called in this flop, I don't have loads of fold equity. I'm gonna check turn and check call one and cry. And I'm just gonna be like seven on the river for value here, expect to get snapped with trash because he's clearly a bad fish. I don't know how I feel about my fold against him now. I think that was the same guy I folded the river against in that ridiculous spot. I don't know. I think that makes it way more likely he was bluffing because he seems like a spewy fish, to be honest. So I think I should just have called there. But it also means it's way more likely that he slow plays like nuts on the turn. So I'm not totally bothered about my line there. What do you show up with? Wow. Okay. Yeah, like two pair. He's clearly like an aggro fish. I should actually just tag him and not be lazy in case I run into him again in the future. Aggro fish stat tag for you, sir. Congratulations. I should present like a ceremony for these guys when they earn the aggro fish stat. I give them a medal and make them feel good about it. No dice for the kings, unfortunately. And that's the end. Anticlimactic few last few hands, but yeah, fun video, fun spots, very plus EV games, very beatable, clearly feeling very comfortable and like I can crush this. So yeah, when I get this book done, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna crush some zoom, I think. I mean people are encouraging me to play on like they're like, man, you should play on Sky Poker or Party or whatever and or or um what's it called, eight 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 and just like crush but I just like playing on stars, it's fun, it's aesthetically pleasing. The games are still so soft and beatable, even with the rake back reductions and the um strengthening player pool. There's still so much money to be made. People still play bad, you know. Um yeah, I just have every bit of confidence I can crush it. So I'll probably be doing that at some point. And would advise you guys, like, don't feel like the games are dead these days. They're not. I mean you can see how badly people play there, you know. That's fine. And that's not even table side, I think that's playing in a tough zoom pool at a tough time of the day. So Still money in the game. Don't be disheartened. See you guys on the next one. Good luck at the tables.